Coming up on DTNS, Amazon cuts off NSO Group because of its surveillance software. U.S. and allies make coordinated protests against China's role in cyber attacks and growing peppers in Spain. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, July 19th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, poet Andrew Heaton. Welcome to the show. Hello, pleasure to be here. I mean, you may know Andrew Heaton as host of Alienating the Audience in the Political Orphanage, author of Los Angeles's hideous poems about an ugly city, but that last has put you on the map, my friend. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, as of last week, I am a best-selling uh, poetry author. I, I hit number one in poetry on Amazon, meaning that uh, I have now eclipsed comedy and punditry and romance as a poet, which is apparently the best thing I am at life. And I'll take it and uh, all the accolades that go there with. If you want to know more about Heaton's future plans as a poet, uh, get our wider conversation on Good Day Internet. You can get that by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Zoom has purchased call center technology company Five9 for $14.7 billion in an all-stock transaction, with the deal expected to close in the first half of 2022. Zoom is expecting the purchase to increase long-term growth and provide more products to businesses as more companies return to working in actual offices. Nintendo took the unusual move of denying a Bloomberg report that was published last week claiming the upcoming $350 OLED version of the Nintendo Switch would have higher profit margins than the regular model due to higher end components in the OLED switch and that Nintendo could be making up to $40 more per model sold. In a statement, Nintendo said, to ensure correct understanding among our investors and customers, we want to make clear that the claim is incorrect. However, it did not offer any information about the profit margins of either switch console. Tencent will buy British game developer Sumo Digital for $1.27 billion after previously holding an 8.75% stake in the company. Sumo is best known for their contract work developing Sackboy, a big adventure for the PlayStation 5, and was the main studio for Microsoft's Crackdown 3 on Xbox and PC. Uh, we're seeing some examples of that chip shortage affecting the smartphone industry, uh, not only slowing shipments, but also some significant price increases. Samsung's problems sourcing some key parts created an expected 20% drop in shipments from the previous quarter. Google said its Pixel 5a 5G device would be available only in the U.S. and Japan after wider releases in the past. Xiaomi's Red Note 10 was released in India for about $161, but now retails for about $174. And Xiaomi's Mi 11 Ultra sales are delayed in India as well. You may have missed the official announcement a couple weeks ago, but Windows 11 is moving to a yearly update model, much like Android, iOS, and Mac OS already do. Smaller security updates and fixes will still roll out incrementally, but annual updates will arrive in the second half of the calendar year and offer two years of support for most users with three years for enterprise and education. All right, let's talk about that NSO Group story. A forensic analysis report from Amnesty International claims NSO Group's Pegasus software was used by clients to compromise the phones of more than 1,000 people, including heads of state, politicians, journalists, activists, business executives, and more, in more than 50 countries. The majority of the names on a list released to media uh, were located in Azerbaijan, Bahrain, Hungary, India, Kazakhstan, Mexico, Morocco, uh, Rwanda, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. Citizen Lab peer-reviewed the findings, uh, so it wasn't just Amnesty International making these claims. The NSO group says the report is full of wrong assumptions and uncorroborated theories, though, and that the company only sells its technology to, quote, vetted government agencies for use against criminals and terrorists. The report claims zero-click iMessage attacks have been used going all the way back to 2018, and worked all the way up to iOS 14. Zero click means if you receive the message, you're compromised. You didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to tap on anything, open a link, whatever. After which the attacker would be able to collect data, activate the mic and camera on the compromised phone. Amnesty Security Lab probed 67 phones in particular. 34 were iPhones and all had experienced attempts to crack in. 23 of those 34 iPhones showed evidence of a successful Pegasus infection. 
22 phones from people in India were also examined. Seven of those contained NSO malware, some of which were owned by India's opposition politicians. The Pegasus tool sent its acquired data through commercial services like AWS and Amazon CloudFront. And when Amnesty International presented its findings to Amazon, Amazon terminated service for NSO Group. Uh, however, NSO Group uses multiple providers, including DigitalOcean, OVH, and Linode. Uh, so they aren't offline. Uh, but I, I think that may be one of the more interesting things here. We've known about Pegasus for a long time. There's been a lot of accusations that it's being used to spy on activist journalists, politicians, et cetera. Uh, but the fact that Amazon, in the past, when they've been confronted about providing service to NSO Group, just remained silent, uh, in this case, cut them off and said, you know what, uh, we don't, we don't want to take their money anymore. I mean, I guess as there are multiple providers, uh, the Pegasus tool, you know, there's besides just having knowledge of 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 these uh, zero click attacks happening, this isn't the biggest deal. It is a big move because, of course, it's AWS. If the other providers were to follow suit, that would be interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I these sorts of stories always come back to okay, NSO Group saying. No, okay, uh, Amnesty International it just isn't correct here. Citizen Lab peer reviewing the findings. You're not correct here. You're missing the point. We're just going after the really, really bad people. Well, without enough evidence to support that and the evidence to support that all these people are getting targeted and attacked, it's like, I don't I don't think the, comp the company is, is not pushing back hard enough. That's, it's not a good defense. Keaton, what do you make of this? I agree. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, what we're talking about is 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 not. I I don't think anybody has any uh, illusions that uh, you know that NSO Group isn't helping governments crack down on on journalists. But also, the NSO Group doesn't have to be lying when it says. Uh, we vet government agencies. We only sell to government agencies. Uh, and they only use it against criminals and terrorists because many of the companies named in this report consider journalists and activists to be criminals or terrorists, the way they define criminals and terrorists, right? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm generally inclined to think it's probably happening and, and tend to assume that if there's going to be some sort of balance between atrophying privacy rights versus uh, everybody agreeing not to spy on people, that it's probably going to be more of the latter. And it's been going on for an incredibly long time. Like we had a, a, a thing in the United States for a while called Project Echelon, where uh, I, I don't know if it's still going on or not, but basically it was illegal for the United States to spy on our own citizens without a warrant. So we just went, uh, Canada, would you like to spy on all of our people? And if you see anything interesting, we'll pass it to us. We'll do the same thing. And we we just spied on all, all, all the British countries and former British countries would spy on each other. And I think they're pretty restrained compared to some of these other parties. So it wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, I, and that goes back to what you were saying, Sarah, which is NSO Group didn't get cut off by Amazon. Uh, but I do think that's significant, even if it doesn't stop NSO Group uh, from being able to conduct its business. Uh, Amazon taking a principled stand here. Sure, maybe they have enough cash now that they can afford it and they just don't want the bad press associated with it. That's probably a majority of the motivation. Uh, but it does now provide a precedent where uh, you will see Amnesty International and Citizen Lab put pressure on other providers to be to you know say, hey, Amazon cut them off. What about you? And NSO Group, no matter what you think of it, is at best gray hat. Uh, you know they are they are taking advantage of of uh, vulnerabilities and not making them public. Uh, they are not they're not selling these vulnerabilities, but also uh, contributing to world security. They keep these things private and they try not to let anybody find out about them and until they figured out a new one that can replace it. Well, streaming services, all the rage. Warner Media has got another one for us. The company will launch a streaming news service in the US under the CNN banner called, I'll give you one guess, just one, CNN Plus. You were right. Mm, yep. The service will launch sometime after the first year in 2022, first of the year. So, you know, sometime early next year. But no word on how much it will cost yet. We'll probably find that out. I don't know, somewhere before the first of the year, 2022, there will only be an ad-free subscription. So no free ad-supported tier, at least not now. Much like ESPN, CNN will include access to its CNN Plus content in the existing CNN app, alongside any access you have to CNN through a TV subscription. CNN Plus will include original live and on-demand programming, but separate from the existing channels. So what you see on CNN and CNN Plus is not going to be the same live programming. 
CNN Plus will also include access to past seasons of CNN shows, so, you know, back catalog stuff. And the new content will be made by existing CNN staff, along with 400 people being hired just for CNN Plus. So this so is this a fairly major operation. I mean, they're hiring a, a big swath of folks. This is this is the companies uh, seeing the writing on the wall that their cable subscriptions are going to go away. Now the move could be you might think, oh well, then make CNN available for a subscription in an app. But they can't do that because of the agreements they have with the cable carriers. And enough people haven't moved off cable that they can risk getting pulled from the cable carriers and losing that revenue. So they have to split the difference. That's what ESPN did. They said, well, we have ESPN Plus, and we'll try to make it more and more compelling. When ESPN Plus first launched, it was just some extra games from regional sports networks. Now, as we talked about last week, they're going to start putting prime games on there. They're going to start being able to get away with a little more as they renegotiate agreements. I'm guessing that's what CNN's doing here, is, is plowing the field for a future more robust offering as they slowly see their audience migrate from cable to online streaming. But right now, like you either have to not get CNN at all and want to get some, even if it's not the main channel. Uh, and so you'll be willing to pay for this, or you're a CNN enthusiast who's like more CNN. Right. Great. Take my money. Uh, Heaton, I, I'm curious in your perspective, having worked in this industry yeah. before, you know, how many people do you think CNN might be able to get? Well, I, I, I love the idea of somebody that is already watching a 24-hour news network and goes, I need more hours of content than 24 hours per day. This is insufficient. <laughs> I would like to have my TV screen going and my phone going at the same time so that I can get it double. That said, though, I do think you're right, Tom, and I think you're spot on. Um, when I started working in cable television news, I was a writer there for three years. And one of the, just when I was beginning and was very fresh, I was hanging out in the control room and I talked to one of the vice presidents and just trying to spark conversation. I went, how are things different now than when you first started? And very quickly he went, if they ever figure out how to unbundle cable, we are in so much trouble. Because he he was like, the, the, the deal we all have right now is if you want one group, you got to get all groups, which means that if you know you, you really like ESPN, you're also going to get Fox Business and CNN and all these different things. And uh, as that's starting to atrophy and as more and more people don't care about television, um, they're going to need to scramble. Like, for example, I was a television writer. I do not know how to watch the show I used to write for. I could not at this moment watch it if I felt like it because I don't have a TV and I don't know how to do it. And so I, I think there's a lot of people that they're relying on that are in a wealthy but dwindling age cohort that are not going to be available forever and they're going to have to figure out what to do. Yeah. You know, this, at this, the, at, yeah, but I think, yes, everyone, everyone's <laughs> good points, everyone so far. It does yes. seem like what I, when I first saw eight to 12 hours of live programming that is not, existing CNN programming, it's additional programming and this big team to run that programming. I was like, yeah, who, I, even if you're a CNN enthusiast, there simply aren't enough hours in the day, but it also gives uh, the opportunity to try out some new hosts, try out some new formats. I mean, there's only so much that CNN itself can do before people go, this is crazy. This isn't the CNN that I want. And that becomes a problem in itself. And so, yes, that slow migration of original programming, some of which will stick along with a back catalog of enough CNN programming that you go, okay, yeah, this is the same brand. I get it. Uh, it could be successful down the road. I would like to know how much it will cost. Well, and, and that's, that's what they're doing. Uh, they know that the people who don't watch CNN on cable because they don't have cable are a different demographic. And so they can create, it's basically launching a new channel, but instead of launching it on cable targeted at a younger demographic, they're launching it online where that demographic is more likely to watch. The difference is mm -hmm. NBC is doing that mostly for free, whereas mm. CNN is kept bargaining that, oh, maybe they'll pay if we give them a bunch of Anthony Bourdain old episodes and stuff along with it. Online glasses seller Warby Parker has released a virtual vision test, which lets most users renew their prescriptions using an iPhone 6S or newer. 6S is, you know, that goes back a bit. So it's a, it's a fair amount of folks. If you're between the ages of 18 and 65 with no existing health eye concerns and a single vision distance prescription, you can use the app. You also need a copy of your current prescription and your current glasses or contacts. The phone's vision framework makes sure that you're 10 feet away, and then the app takes you through the usual, can you read these numbers and signs and letters tests? It takes about 10 minutes. 
then an eye doctor will review your results and decide if your prescription can indeed be renewed within two days. If your prescription is the same, you pay 15 bucks. If it can't be renewed, you don't pay anything. And at which point you would probably go to your doctor. As a glasses wearer who cannot take advantage of this because I've got progressive lenses, uh, I'm not sure I would anyway. I, I, I don't know about you, Heaton, but- uh, 100%, 100%. I, I, I feel like I need to go see the eye doctor every year anyway, just to make sure I'm not getting glaucoma or you know do all those tests. And I just get my prescription renewed then, if, whether it changes or not. I suppose if you're younger, maybe you're not as worried about you know going in, even though you probably should, uh, and and the convenience and the well, I don't have to go into a uh, an enclosed space with a bunch of people and wear a mask might make this uh, more attractive. But you, it sounds like you're on the same page as me. Oh no, no, I'm in. I'm a hundred like like go Warby Parker. I'm all oh, about okay. this. I think this is great. Now, now, granted, I have very light corrective lenses. I really I, I need them if I'm looking at a computer for a long period of time. I don't need them for other things. So. I, I'm in the light camp. That said, I think optometrists are like the shady used car dealers of the 21st century, where you you go in, they they partially blind you, they dilate your eyes, they put weird interrogation lights in front of you and talk to you, and you're all messed up from this experience. And then they pop you out into the glasses store. And they don't ask, do you want to buy glasses? It's presumed. And they just have somebody usually who acts unnecessarily like you're more charming than you are and you're handsome at all glasses and then pretty quick you're racking up like $500 frames whereas I like I've used some online stuff where I just used my old prescription and and kicked in and paid like $100 for the glasses I'm wearing right now if if um that, I mean that might change like I've like we've we've had some blindness in my family uh last Thanksgiving I was talking to my dad and he was like um yeah grandma Bickle tough old bird she uh uh you know went went blind at 92 quit driving 94 and uh, just really hung in there. And and I was thrown off by the chronology of that, but apparently she memorized all the turns in her town so she could just go grocery shopping once a week while blind. And I'm like, at that point, I might need to really go to an optometrist. But until then, happy to use an app. Yeah, as, in, as a person with a, uh, a new a subscription, <laughs> prescription to contact lenses, I mean, just really over the last few months, I was not even totally aware that I was going to have to re-up this whole thing annually because I just never went to the optometrist before until I started to have issues reading computers, kind of like you, mm -hmm. Andrew, where it, it it became something where I was like, okay, I can't ignore this anymore. Um, so the idea that I could just have one less doctor visit per year, if I really felt like, hey, my eyes feel great, I don't have any issues, that, that this seems like a super convenient way to go about that. Uh, but Tom, to your point, we should not ignore going to the doctor. Yeah. I'm also uh, an entire hypocrite because I, I went to the eye doctor for the first time when Reagan was president and didn't return <laughs> until the Obama administration. So, uh, you know, I've changed my ways now. Don't be like maybe, me. Maybe you should switch to a papal system where every time there's a new pope, you go and get glasses. I would have gone a lot in like mm -hmm. late 70s, but then, yeah, I wouldn't have gone <laughs> for a long time. So. Does a retirement count, though, or does it have to... You know, it starts to get complicated with Benedict. Anyway, uh, I digress. Folks, you want to learn Spanish, even if you're like, no, I don't. Yeah, you do. And before you do, you want to get your <laughs> Spanish tech skills up to speed. Here's NTX's Dan Campos to help. Hello, friends of DTNS. It is time for the word of the day, brought to you by Noticias de Tecnología Express. Today's word is barbaridad. It doesn't have a proper translation in English and can mean different things. First, you can use it to refer to excessive quantities. If there is a lot of something, es una barbaridad. Second, you can use it to indicate when someone says something that makes no sense, like when a public figure is posting barbaridades on Twitter. Finally, you can also use it to express admiration or surprise. ¿Qué barbaridad? You can learn this and more words by listening to Noticias de Tecnología Express, available every Friday. Canada, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, the US, collect them all. They're the five eyes, and they have joined up with the European Union, Japan, and NATO to issue a joint statement claiming the People's Republic of China hired cyber attackers. Hired is the operative word here. Hired cyber attackers responsible for multiple attacks. And the U.S. says in particular it has high confidence that groups hired by China were directly responsible for the March attacks that affected 30,000 Microsoft email exchange servers. You remember we talked about that on DTNS. It wasn't a vulnerability 
Uh, it was a zero day vulnerability. It wasn't a Microsoft operated error, uh, but they were able to get into those exchange servers. The EU said the attacks and others were linked to advanced persistent threat 40 and advanced persistent threat 30. You probably, if you see them covered, uh, see them referred to as APT 40, APT 30. It's the first time that NATO has signed on to a formal condemnation of China's cyber activities. The statement details more than 50 different techniques used by state-sponsored malicious actors and offers recommended mitigations to implement. So this is not just a condemnation. Uh, it's also got some useful information for businesses out there. The U.S. accuses China's Ministry of State Security of contracting the groups to carry out the attacks, including ransomware attacks meant to generate profit. The U.S. Department of Justice also announced that criminal charges have been filed against four Chinese nationals for, quote, a multi-year campaign targeting foreign governments and entities in key sectors, including maritime, aviation, defense, education, and healthcare, in at least a dozen countries between the periods of 2011 and 2018. Now, the indictment claims the four people, quote, sought to obfuscate the Chinese government's role in such theft by establishing a front company. Uh, and it uh, identifies Hainan as the province out of which they operated. The U.S. has not ruled out further response, but notes that no action will uh, deter China. It is the first official accusation levied directly against the Chinese government of paying groups to carry out these attacks. So first time NATO has signed on to any condemnation, and the first time the U.S. has said specifically, we think you're paying them. We think you're the ones behind it. You're, you're writing the checks. It's interesting to note that over the weekend, the Wall Street Journal reported the U.S. government asked the Netherlands ASML not to sell ultraviolet lithography systems to Chinese chip makers. Uh, those aren't necessarily related, but that combined with the pressure on Huawei uh, could mean that the U.S. might be pursuing a policy of using leverage against China. And maybe we'll loosen up the ultraviolet lithography for your homegrown chip industry if you do some things to change your ways on the cyber attacks. Although how you vet that and how you prove that is a whole different conversation. Uh, but what, what what do you all think of this? It's it's in the end it sounds like somebody getting mad and saying stop that. Uh, but it's certainly the most complicated and forceful stop that that we've seen yet. And uh, unusually, uh, China usually has a very quick dismissive response to this, and I haven't seen a response yet. When when you were a kid, did you ever play Monopoly? And there was just one kid that took it way more intensely than all the other kids. And you, you'd use the bathroom and you'd come back and all of a sudden there'd be like nine hotels on Tibet. And you were like, I didn't think you even had Tibet earlier. And they're like, we've always had to bet. We've always had nine. That's how I feel about the Chinese government. And I, this kind of espionage saddens me so much because it shows the decline in mutual respect between great nations. Back in my day, back during the Cold War, when Russia and the United States uh, spied on each other, we had enough respect for each other as enemies to send over honeypots to seduce people. So mm -hmm. at least there'd be some hottie that would come over and and go to cocktail parties and eventually seduce people for information. Now it's all done online. I think that's a cowardly way to conduct espionage. So I hope we revert back to the old system and I'll say open it up to both genders. Well, you could still do it online. It's just hot McHale will be, you know, cyber texting you, not uh, <laughs> uh, showing up at your that's right. hotel. Yeah. Nah, don't care for that at all. Sarah, what do you make of this? Well, I don't know. You know, these sorts of stories I, I think, okay, so Canada, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, the US, the European Union, Japan, everybody is saying, this is what China has done. China has hired people to do this. Here's our evidence. This is that is what this is something specific that happened earlier in the year that we can trace back to this. And China kind of going, hmm. I I there's a part of me that I understand these sorts of relationships are very complicated. Yes, and there's so you know lots of lots of economic trade stuff that falls into play here. It's not just a matter of the U.S. Uh, you know being the country that I live in, saying China, you're wrong, and everyone's arrested, kind of thing. But it's it's it, I find it like increasingly hard to believe that there's so much that we know and yet nothing changes. I I. I just wanted to add my two cents here real quick. I think it's more of a political posturing because what China has been doing up until now has been picking on members within those alliances that they deem to be the weakest link. For example, they've recently been picking on New Zealand by threatening their trade. And the idea was that if they could pick off the smaller nations away, they could slowly, like pulling a thread out of a sweater, you can unravel the whole thing. 
And I think the idea behind this is to present a unified uh, voice and a unified kind of, you know, uh, ex expression. We're saying that we all together say that we we are accusing you of this or that you are some way behind it. And that way, there there's kind of a collective uh, push behind it instead of just having a, a few of the stronger members doing it where where it's just like, all right, the big guys say it, but what about the the small guys? Kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that's part of it. I I also think that in the past, uh, it was. We think APT 40 is behind this. And China would say, no, they're not. That's ridiculous. Uh, and what's different here is APT 40 is behind it. We're tired of it. Uh, and we need you to stop. Now, stopping short of saying, and we're going to do sanctions, uh, which would be more provocative. But again, I, I point out that China has not been dismissive of this. China hasn't done their usual shrug of like, ah, you're imagining things. Uh, I imagine they will. Uh, but just the fact that they're pausing a little longer to think about it uh, is is some sort of a, of an effect. Whether that will turn into anything or not, who knows? Uh, and also, I uh, I think the most practical part of this is having a unified document that says, "Hey, here's some mitigations. Here's some best practices. We're calling you out. Uh, you don't have to even take responsibility. We know what you're doing, and here's how to stop it, world." Uh, I think is maybe one of the more powerful parts of the entire statement. Well, and you know what might turn into something? What, Sarah? Chili pepper seeds. Okay? <laughs> Hear me out. Yes, me out. these will actually turn into something, un 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 <laughs> unlike uh, yeah. political rhetoric. You're right. Uh, NASA astronauts are growing red and green chili peppers on the International Space Station for what NASA says will be one of the longest and most challenging plant experiments attempted aboard the orbital lab. The 48 chili pepper seeds hitched a ride to the station in June on a SpaceX commercial resupply services mission. And NASA's Shane Kimbrough inserted the seeds, they were already inside a science carrier device, into the Advanced Plant Habitat, or APH, on July 12th. The APH is the largest plant growth facility on the ISS, sporting 180 sensors and even allowing partial control from the Kennedy Space Center back on Earth to make sure those peppers are looking okay. These are hatch green chilies too, uh, which green chilies when they get ripened become red chilies, which is why you're seeing their red and green chilies. But uh, these these are the kind of peppers that uh, in, in these parts here, when they show up at the grocery store, they put a big banner up, like the hatch green chilies are here, fresh from New Mexico. Get up, like this, this is good stuff. I think this is glorious. I like. I'm I'm a big fan of of the the privatization currently going on in the space industry with Elon Musk and with Jeff Bezos and all of that thing. So I like that the interesting innovation and passenger dynamics is coming from the private sector. That said, I love NASA, and I would love NASA to focus on one of two things: uh, either kind of um, work a day boring research type stuff and weird quirky stuff like this and nasa now developing anti-gravity chili which is absolutely what they should call it is yeah. a phenomenal step in that direction I, I love it when they do this like a couple when i worked on the hill i used to go to astronaut meet and greets and just hang out with the astronauts and the ones mm -hmm. that i talked to the last time i did it had like a canadian company gave them like a million dollars to hit a golf ball from space and I, I talked to them like about how many times do you think it went around the world? And they were like, it probably went around the world two or 300 times. And then I went, could it have could feasibly made it through the stratosphere? And they went, it could have. And I was like, so it's possible you hit a hole in one from space. <laughs> and if that happened, we'd all have to become immediately religious. We just have to go, yep, this has yep. been organized. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, this one comes from Sean. The age-old question, does anybody have a suggestion as to where to go to find the best method to illuminate or at least eliminate, rather, or at least lessen spam texts? Sean says, about the best I've found without installing additional apps is just to block the sender. But that gets old really quick, and I think the sender is banking on that. Occasionally, something does pop up that says that the sender isn't in my contact list to report junk. I've seen this before, but not terribly recently. Uh, I, I assume Sean already turned on uh, the the anti spam uh, text and and call uh, setting in his phone. Uh, but just in case anybody didn't know that existed, uh, check your phone. Uh, all phones have this now, where, and it's not always on. Uh, you may wonder why it's not always on, but it's not always on. So you you need may need to go in there and say like, yeah, block suspected spam texts and calls. Uh, you can also try getting on the do not call list, although. 
you know, that only reduces the people who are willing to play by the rules of the do not call list, which is not most of the, the stuff you're going to get. Uh, and so then it's up to your carrier and different carriers have different plans and different options. Some of them automatically do it. T-Mobile does it for me. I'll get the like, you know, uh, scam uh, suspected message uh, on certain uh, phone numbers and, and I can go into my carrier uh, settings online and I can say just automatically block those or let them through and just let me know. Uh, so, so there's a few things you can do. Probably if you really, really need to block them, uh, third party apps are, are the only super effective way to do it though. Uh, I'm currently going through this because in promoting my book, Los Angeles is hideous. I bought the domain LA is ugly.com and whoever I bought it from, apparently sells all of my information out because I've been getting text messages and phone calls multiple times a day the last week. And the only thing I've come up with is I now pick up the phone and I am very nice because these are just regular people, but I strongly indicate I might've murdered someone. Like I just, I mention offhand, like I, I could use some marketing. I promise I haven't killed anybody. And I keep repeating that until eventually the conversation concludes. Yeah. The, <laughs> as entertaining as that is, all that really does is confirm that you have a working number. <laughs> That's true, so. you're right. Ah, okay, I'll get that third party app. All right, all right. I know. I I have also been guilty of engaging in ways where I find myself to be, you know, uh, very clever. But yeah, the spam. I got one during the show just now. Potential spam. Uh, mm -hmm. Many of them don't say that though, and they're all spam. So my we have my ways personal. To go yet. My personal hero, uh, Dave Barry, um, ran for president in 2020, and the top thing in his platform was identifying and giving the death penalty to uh, telemarketers. Uh, that was his main provision. And I was like, if he if he managed to get into the debates, I think he might have won just based on that alone. Yeah, there's not a lot of love out there mm -mm. Uh, for that. No, definitely not. Uh well, if you have uh, perhaps something that Sean hasn't tried uh, that you'd like to pass along, question, comments about anything we talk about here on DTNS, do send it our way. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. Today, they include Tim Ashman, Johnny Hernandez, and High Tech Oki. Also, we got a few brand new bosses, three exactly. Stephen Straczynski, Julie Nosko, and Robert L. Rasheda all just started backing us on Patreon. We thank you three, the three amigos. Thank you, Stephen, Julie, and Robert. We've been pushing for four for a couple of days. And uh, again, I, I hesitate, I, I, I do not hesitate to emphasize, it's not Stephen, Julie, and Robert's fault we didn't make four today. They all did their part, yeah. So, uh, we, you know what? Do not let their uh, efforts go in vain. We've got to make it four tomorrow. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Got to make it four. Uh, Andrew Heaton, such a pleasure to have you back on the show. Uh, you, you are obviously all over the place these days, and sorry about all the spam that you're getting, but Thank congratulations you. on Thank your you. success. Let folks know where they can keep up with everything you're doing. Uh, I would recommend that you go to laisugly.com so that you can check out my new and glorious book, Los Angeles is Hideous, Poems About an Ugly City, which I believe is the funniest coffee table book ever written about the quote-unquote city of angels. Excellent. Also at the Mighty Heaton on Twitter. If uh, if you, I don't know. If it's you it's at Mighty with... Heaton. There's no the, but yeah, feel free to uh, it, it, at, at Mighty Heaton if anybody wants to continue oh, dialoguing with me. Fight me. I stand like corrected. That. I stand corrected. We are live on this show Monday through Friday. You can correct me all day long. 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 20.30 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll be back at it tomorrow with Jen Cutter joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>